Hi, guys. Welcome to the Gig Economy Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We have Jesper and, of course, me, Jason. And then interviewing tonight, Toby, is it Shaver? Yep. Just Shaver. like just like how it's, how it's spelled. That, that's super <laughs> yes, easy. Um, having from, trouble tonight, huh, Jason? No, I'm not having trouble. It's perfect. <laughs> Usually, I struggle with the last name. Uh, Toby's from GR2Go, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is and what he does there. But Toby, tell us a little bit about uh, you as a gig worker. Uh, I don't know you other than I've seen you on some of the chats uh, or local Facebook groups, but I assume you're a gig worker. How did that get started? And uh, and what are you doing with that now? Well, I kind of came to it uh, the other way around a little bit. So about I'd say around 2016 ish, I started a company called Grab It to Go, which was basically, you know, a third party delivery service like DoorDash. This was before DoorDash came to town and before Uber Eats was here. And, you know, Grubhub kind of had a presence in, in Grand Rapids, but they weren't staffing their own drivers at that point. They were just a portal at that point. Um, so I started that business. And then as these giant companies started to roll into town and kind of, you know, cut into market share and really just go at it with these huge advertising budgets, they squashed me pretty quick. So okay. I kind of, you know, tiptoed into gig work to basically fill up my slow time. I mean, I was somewhat of a one man show most of the time. Um, so, you know, I would do Uber and, you know, a little bit of DoorDash on the side uh, doing it that way. So that's kind of how I got into gig working to begin with. OK, so when you started that business, that was just you just kind of having an idea that like this is something that Grand Rapids needs. Yeah, I, I thought that it was a pretty uh, underserved market. I mean, there was a company that that still exists called uh, Mr. Delivery that's now uh, something else. I don't know. It kind of keeps evolving into um, some other brands. But this was before they were even Mr. Mr. Delivery. And they were doing third party, but they were mostly on the south end of town. Um, you know, and there there was just room in town for more. Um, so I, I started that business kind of part time while I was working in I was working in school fundraising, actually, at the time. So I just kind of did a little bit on the side and grew it into full time and then kind of slowly it w <laughs> got weaned back down into, you know, part time as as I got uh, crushed week so by week. <laughs> tell us a little bit more about how that was working back then. And you said it's a third party delivery service. How how exactly, how did it differ from the Uber Eats and the Grubhubs as, as we know them today? Uh, it really did it just in the sense that it was just operated locally. You know, it was something, you know, and kind of, kind of the same principles that, that I'm trying to run GR to go as it is today, where it's more of a local operation where there's actually a face to it. I think one of the the problems I think that a lot of restaurants have with third party delivery is it is somewhat anonymous. I mean, you, there's rating systems and things like that, but you know, that's almost a, a second part time job for the restaurant owners to, you know, right. worry about rating drivers and keeping track of that. But you know, if it's something that's in house, you know, a, a a mom and pop shop pizza restaurant who has their own delivery drivers, you know, they have a quality control that, you know, a DoorDash can never have because it's just too sure. anonymous and too big and not handled locally. Right, right. So so how were you doing? So you would take the order and then go and order it and pick it up and pay for it? And how, how was that? Um, well, we had a website, you know, just like, I mean, this was before app. I mean, there yep. were everybody had apps, but it was a little bit uh, the barrier to entry was a little bit higher at that time to get a, okay. a good yep. functional app. But, you know, I had a website that was mobile friendly. So, you know, people that were ordering on, on their phones still had a pretty good experience and they would order for me. And I kind of had a combination at that point. You know, some of the third party services have all of their restaurants under contract and some yep. of them kind of add restaurants menus and, and, you know, have a little markup and it's not an actual arrangement as much as it is just a, you know, a, a pickup service kind of thing. I right, had a combination right, right. of both. I had restaurants locally that were, 
you know, under contracts with me, not exclusive. So obviously when, you know, DoorDash and Uber showed up, they, they joined up with them as well. So, um, you know, so mine was a combination of both. So people would okay. order from my website and then, you know, it would either automatically go to that restaurant or I would place the order manually. Oh, I get you. So how then you had drivers that were on payroll then must be right. Be- just say, same as Uber and DoorDash, all independent contractors that, you know, just, you know, every, the thing is with with gig work, as you guys know, you know, there's really there's really no way to do it you know, exclusively with one company, if you're, if you're doing right. independent contractors, you have to know that, you know, <laughs> your, your drivers are going to be, you know, working for the other companies too. And, and kind of, I guess your job is to just make it as enticing as possible for them to be available to you more than they are to, you know, Uber, which th- these days isn't as hard. Yeah, I feel like you you could have had an advantage, or, and I don't know what you charge, but I hear all these horror stories from a lot of the restaurants that they're charging 35 or 40%. I mean, if you came in at 25%, uh, maybe not at the time that all the apps exploded, but like after all this pandemic and how everyone's so frustrated with everything, I wonder if it would be... Uh, I know you've moved past that point, but I'm just speculating in my head. I wonder if somebody could have an advantage over those bigger apps. Uh, maybe not with somebody like a McDonald's or a Taco Bell where it's kind of corporation wide. You know what I mean? But maybe a, yeah. a smaller like three restaurants in GR or something like that. And that's all they have. I don't know. And that's the idea. And and to be honest, I, I, I would not be surprised if the pendulum kind of swings that way into the future. Now, I'm I'm out of the third party delivery business now. <laughs> and and for for multiple reasons, I'm I'm glad to be so. But, right. uh, you know, I, I can definitely see a future in gig work where, you know, these drivers are just fed up with the lack of support and just being you know just a number and yes. just being a commodity to these companies and i can see you know these smaller companies rising back up again and kind of getting market share just in their little pocket you know not worrying about you know world domination like all of these you know venture backed corporations and then i think at the end of the day that could bring maybe a higher level of customer service yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, I I do lawn fertilization. I worked for the same company for 12 years and I come back every year because they take real good care of us. They pay us well. They treat us like human beings. They respect us. And you don't get any of that in, in that kind of food delivery uh, gig, in any gig, honestly. Um, so <laughs> yeah. why don't you tell us about your new venture? Uh, I don't know how new it is. I just happened to see you post. Was it DoorDash, that group that you posted? I can't. I couldn't quite remember. I didn't even know about it. So tell us about the gr to go what it is, and uh, what you're trying to do. So gr to go kind of came from, you know, basically what was a pivot with, with grab it to go uh in 2019 finally it was like you know i lost the the delivery wars with the the restaurants it wasn't going to happen so i you know rather than just kind of scrap the whole thing and move on i kind of pivoted to just a direct delivery of convenience store items you know i i saw this business model done where rather than having cust- having drivers, you know, go out and shop for these items or pick up from a restaurant or, you know, the kind of the Instacart model where they go to the grocery store and shop it, you know, the model where the company actually warehouses the items and then, you know, what's available for sale on the website is actually there. It's in stock and, you know, it's a much faster delivery process by going directly to the customer. So when an order is placed rather than have to having to dispatch a driver to go shop, we simply have to dispatch a driver to just deliver the order. Yeah. So I, the only other company I know that does that and is, is GoPuff. Uh, so, and I'm sure you're very familiar with them and GoPuff was actually supposed to come here two years ago. Um, me and another gig worker in town were like, yeah, we signed up like this is going to happen. And then the pandemic happened. Yeah. Uh, and and so then I haven't heard anything from them. They've just kind of 
at least in this area. I mean, they had a location by the Coke plant and everything like that's what it was going to be. And it's just been crickets. Yeah. And as far as I know, they're still coming. I, I was kind of surprised that they got delayed because it seems like the pandemic would have been a perfect time right. for them to to launch here, you know, for obvious reasons. So I think it's just, you know, it's another one of those things, Jason. It's like these big companies, you know, they, they, they're very focused on growth and they're great at it. You know, yeah. they, they start out, I mean, these guys, they're doing the same, they did, did it the same way I'm doing it. You know, mm -hmm. they started it out of their college dorm room and, you know, really small, like I, like I'm doing and, you know, they're, they're so successful now and they, they're taking round after round of investment money, but you know, the bigger you get, the slower you are to move. So that cycle, you know, kind of everything slows down in expansion like that. So, you know, even when they get here, I mean, it's going to be another, I mean, I've signed myself up basically for another David and Goliath battle, which, mm -hmm. you know, whatever maybe i didn't learn my lesson the first time but i did learn some things and i think that hopefully we'll have a chance to kind of capitalize on the fact that we're local and maybe do some things that that go puff is going to be too big and slow to do so for people that are listening that don't know what you are even doing uh why don't you explain a little bit i mean i think they might get the gist of it but how how your <laughs> so here's the market works. we serve this is basically what we serve when you're at home and you have something that you forgot you forgot toilet paper you know you very could easily go out and get toilet paper but you forgot it and you need it so you can go on the gr to go app and you'll have it within a half hour it's a done deal it's basically you know, 7-Eleven in your pocket kind of is, yeah. is the idea of it. So, you know, it's a much smaller selection of SKUs, you know, of items than than what you're going to get if you go to, you know, like an Instacart or a Shipt. But, you know, you don't have to schedule a delivery time. It's quick. You know, it's a convenience store in your pocket is the idea. So, you know, 80% of what we sell is snacks and drinks and, you know, ice cream is a, is a big, you know, ice cream <laughs> after midnight is like unbelievable. I mean, it's the majority of majority of our business is ice cream after midnight so it's that kind of stuff i have a i have a story about ice cream i don't know three years ago <laughs> i was at a convention uh in louisville uh actually a lawn care convention and we were in the hotel and i'm like oh, i want ice cream so bad and like i wasn't i wasn't hammered or anything anything like that i just didn't have a car and it, it was i guess uber was around but i don't know why i didn't think about that so I got online where we Uber Eats or whatever it was, and it ended up going to be like $30 for like a pint of ice cream. And I'm like, yeah. I just can't do it. And good conscious, <laughs> like I love ice cream and I like to spend money, but I can't do it. So I didn't pull yeah. the trigger, but. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing with like, you know, the Ubers can be a little tricky like that because there's just the, the little the fees. fees here and there that kind of trickle in and you don't really see the the bottom line. What we try to do is pretty straightforward. I mean, I'm not going to say that our prices are going to compete with, you know, going to Meyer and picking it up, but we try to keep our prices comparable to if you were at a gas station convenience store, the kind of the kind of place that sells the kind of stuff we sell. We try to be competitive with that. And then just a small delivery fee. It's basically two ninety nine in in most of the area. Um, and then that's it. We, okay. we get it to, we get it to you you know in most cases within a half hour okay um so what is your delivery area and then is there an opportunity for uh the customer to tip on the app yes definitely and we we recommend it i mean the the way i've built this you know with with the experiences i've had in in uh you know the gig economy it, <laughs> I, I've really tried to structure everything with the drivers in mind because, you know, I've, I've seen the problems I've experienced it all myself. I mean, all the, the, you know, obviously with this business model, we've eliminated the waiting part of it, which is nice. You don't have to worry about sitting and waiting at a restaurant for the food. Yep. So, you know, we valued that time a little bit there. Um, tipping is, you know, not only, encouraged in the checkout you know we kind of default it pretty high 
and we structure our pay program. And I'm not going to go too deep into the, you know, kind of driver pay model, but we have tip subsidizing. Basically, if yeah. customers don't tip, we make it up. We we pay at least a minimum of two dollar tip on every order, wow. whether the customer's tipped or not. And then the way that we kind of deal with that on the customer end is if a customer is just constantly not tipping and we're having to cover that tip, then we fire that customer because, oh, wow. you know, I mean, we, and you know, you could say you could go the other way. Why don't you just pay the driver a little bit more and, you know, not have to depend on the customer to tip or whatever. But, you know, we live in a society where tipping is part of it. 100%. And my attitude is if you're going to order and you're not going to tip your driver, you know, that's fine. But after a couple of times, then, you know, it's really not the kind of customer that we're interested in having. I so, love that attitude. That's great. That's yeah. unheard of. Uh, I know my boss will fire people because they're just a pain in the ass. They're like, we got plenty of work, man. Like, I'm not dealing with your shit. Anymore. <laughs> well, and, that, and that's the whole thing. That's the difference. Like, you know, when we go up against the go puffs and, you know, as we're already going up against the door dashes and the grub hubs, there's going to be certain battles that we can never win. But there's certain ones that we can. So we're going to just try to win those. And and the way you treat the drivers is a huge one because, you know, a situation like that, a huge company like DoorDash could never do that. They wouldn't right. monitor, you know, customers and, you know, get rid of the ones who don't tip. They wouldn't. It'd be just too much to do. But, you know, I'm a small town. I mean, I'm, I'm just in Grand Rapids. I can still do that. So, so for let's, now. <laughs> go ahead, Jesper. I was just going to say, so where is your warehouse located at? So from a, from a driver perspective, how far would the drive be, you know, at the most to go get the, get the item? The warehouse today is in my basement in East Grand Rapids. And then the warehouse uh, where it's eventually going to be, there's a couple spaces, but your, your question is valid because that's the whole key is to keep it centrally located. Mm -hmm. So the idea is somewhere right right along 131 and then somewhere between like 28th street and you know probably like you know really maybe a mile north or south of there and that's about the sweet spot because you want the drivers to be able to access it quickly pick up quickly and then basically i want them to be able to be to any delivery within 15 minutes from when they pick it up that way if they're 15 you know they're not going to be that far away but that pretty much guarantees that 30 30 minute window yep. which you know i mean we don't guarantee that to the customer but that's our goal that's what we shoot for. sure have you thought about a sub station in allendale <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, that's a great question because that is the whole thing. That's the money shot. Yeah, it it is, and you know, I I uh, you know I imagine ahead to a day when things are a little bit more back to normal, mm -hmm. and you know, college life is a little bit, you know, what what we're accustomed to because obviously that's a great market. I mean, even as it is right now, I mean, we're basically a nine p.m. and after kind of business, you know, for, for the most part. So. Yeah, when that time comes, there is going to have to be a, a a jumping off point from Allendale as well, because that's going to be a, a big market. One thing I asked earlier is just the delivery area. Do you have a a small like a a, a map of how far north, south, east, and west? <laughs> yeah, I mean, essentially, it, it's going to cover you know all the way down you know east into the far end of Kentwood, you know down down past Cascade there, or about to Cascade. And then uh, to the north up, you know, like Comstock Park, you know, the south end of Comstock Park, definitely, you know, the Alpine area is right in, in the sweet spot. And then um, down, you know, almost as far like around Rivertown, you know, a little bit past Rivertown is probably about about the. <laughs> the limit there. Um, I think there might be an extended area, but you know, basically the zones are just set up so that there's a little bit of a premium if somebody orders and they're beyond, you know, a right. certain distance or whatever. But you know, we don't want it to be too crazy just because, you know, right now my issue at, at this stage of the business is, you know, with growth, I have to just keep a couple drivers on the road 
you know, knowing that they're also going to be doing other things. So I can't put too many drivers on because they won't have enough work. But if I have too few, then it might get a little, you know, long delivery times. And, you know, my goal is, you know, the other kind of perk to driving for GR to go is it's a lot easier and a lot more likely to stack orders. So, you know, it's, it's the idea of being able to take two or three at a time yeah. where now all of a sudden your income has grown exponentially where, you know, it doesn't always work out so well with hot food to be doing that. But with what we sell, you know, we can easily load you up when, when business calls for it with two or three orders and, you know, really maximize your mileage and maximize your time invested. Let's talk right. about the driver a little bit. Uh, you don't have to mm-hmm. really talk about the pay. How does, if someone wants to work with you, is it like uh, a commitment from a time commitment? Is it a, hey, you know, I'm clocked in or how, how does that work if someone wanted to drive for you? Okay. So it's a kind of a, you know, it's an interesting time right now because like I was just saying about trying to keep people busy, but not, you know, counting on on trips, you know, that I can't promise at this point, we don't have that level of consistency yet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I look for right now is, you know, just keeping a small team of workers basically for those evening shifts. And then, you know, they don't have to commit to a certain, you know, number of shifts or number of hours, but, you know, obviously that evening availability is what's key. And then the way we structure the pay is if they do want to commit to a certain amount of time, you know, I need to fill certain spots where I know I have drivers. So in exchange for committing that time, you know, even if it's like, you know, hey, I need you on a Thursday night from 9 p.m. until we close just to be available. You may never take any rides, but if you're just available during that time, you're going to qualify for what we do. That's kind of like a profit sharing thing where at the end of the month, you can get up to like a 8% bonus on everything you've delivered, like an actual, you know, kind of skin in the game for the drivers that are willing to say, Hey, you know, I'm your Thursday night guy. I can be there for you for the whole time. But still, because of growth, it's still part of your revenue model right now. So so the risk is limited. I like yeah. that. Well, yeah. Well, and they can still be working. You know, I'm not saying sure. that, that you got to be like, you know, the, the other benefit of being small is, you know, I have drivers that, you know, when I need them, they're probably already on a DoorDash trip right now. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, I understand that. I mean, I've built that in kind of to the timing and everything. So, you know, yeah. I know that I know that they're not sitting, you know, in our driveway waiting to, you know, get a grocery bag. So it's going to depend on be right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, I want everybody making money. And then, you know, as as we get busier, then you know, we can keep them busier and then we'll add people, you know, as needed. But I think the the main struggle I've had with that so far is just that, you know, I I think people see what we're doing and, and maybe kind of equate it to these other apps that are not really locally run. And like, they kind of maybe don't really treat it like, like being part of a company that's trying to build something. It's more just a, another gig. And I don't right. know. And I guess, you know, I, I have mixed feelings about that because they're independent contractors. I can't expect them to, you know, in, invest in it, you know, it, as much as I am invested in it. But my way of doing that is just, you know, cutting them in on it a little bit, you know, I, because money, money talks. Yeah. I think that's <laughs> sure. great. Cause you're right. How do you get that employee that wants to be, have more, you know, like you want them to be more loyal to you. How do you get that other than paying them more? Well, that right. kind of hurts you a little bit, but um, no, I like that. I think that's, that's a great idea. And I think your post said you were looking for drivers, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I am. I, I'll, I'll be honest, guys. I've had some bad experiences in the last few months in particular with, with drivers. So I haven't quite found, you know, the, the right fit, you know, enough to handle what we're doing now. But, uh, you know, that's that's part of it. That's part of the process, I think. And 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 it's fine, you know. 
Unfortunately, it's summer, so Jason can't help you. But you know, well, come winter, I think. <laughs> yeah, come winter time, uh, I'm your guy. I like I do gig work full time from like uh, like mid October to mid March. So, well, the thing is, so you guys know, so you guys have been in the business. I mean, you you know, with you know these door dashes or whatever, like how many drivers have taken so many orders where it's like mm-hmm. you know these giant huge orders, you know that's like a you know hundred and eighty dollar order from Olive Garden that you know you know DoorDash just made forty bucks on it, and you know they did really nothing, you know, other than you know ha- other than facilitate the process, right. right? And and the driver gets paid. You know, maybe you make 20 bucks on that, but it's only because you got tipped 12. You know, right. it's not because you really got an equitable share of that transaction from, you know, as compared to DoorDash. Yeah. So by at least having an opportunity out there for, you know, it, any kind of delivery job, there's always going to be like a, a, delivery of this distance is going to be paid this amount. I mean, that's just kind of the nature of the business. Yep. But if drivers want to be really a part of this and more involved, then, you know, maybe they can start having a percentage of that, you know, so that if they're delivering these huge orders, you know, they get to wet their beak a little on it. hundred percent. Yeah. DoorDash is really the only one that doesn't do mileage. They're like $3. That's the, it doesn't matter how far it is. It's three bucks. And I, I don't understand that. Yeah, and ours is tiered because we don't have really the technology to to do it, you know, like an actual per mile, like an Uber, you know, passenger ride. But, I mean, none of ours. I mean, our minimum is $4, and, you know, that's on a $3 delivery fee. So we're even going on top of the – like, we're not trying to make money as a company on any of the transactions or the delivery fees or the – I mean – we're basically the store. Our money comes the same way the a convenience stores does and the markup okay. on, you know, what we get the product for and what we sell it for. I mean, the, the drivers, you know, participate fully in, in all of the other money, you know, and even, you know, a little bit of the profit money as well. So, so I mean, and I like it that way. So how are you planning on paying for the people who is going right now? It's just you. I get that. Right. But how are you planning on paying for the people that's going to be uh, um, handling the order processing for all the many different locations in the future? Or is that something you've seen the driver do as well? Is it like an unmanned warehouse location? How are you seeing this? That's a really good question. It's interesting that you say the unmanned part of it too, because I, I have considered that like, as Jason was saying earlier about like something in Allendale, you know, I've considered the possibility of having some kind of unmanned, you know, pickup station there that doesn't have to have, you know, cause just one dispatcher could kind of run the whole yep. thing in Grand Rapids. You know, if the, the, the unmanned pickup, like at a satellite location, I think is a really good idea. The, the thing with that, that requires an extra level of trust that sure. you know that I have to become comfortable with. But uh, no, you just I mean, need the, like six cameras. That's all you need. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the, the thing is, I think we've all seen enough behavior on security cameras true. to know that some people just don't give a damn. So, oh, so true. <laughs> I wish I had more faith, but it's funny. It's interesting because actually this week I'm, you know, speaking of the shameless. I'm, I have an applicant, you know, that, that wanted to come drive for GR to go that obviously did not make the connection that we used to be gravid to go and has no recollection that like he basically (laughs) ghosted me with a whole bunch of product and money that he owed me. Oh my God. And like basically said, uh, you know, hey, I'm I'm on disability. I'm judgment proof. Good luck getting your money if you take me to court or whatever. Oh my goodness! And then he applied to be a driver last week. Please tell me you <laughs> booked an interview with him. Oh no, I've just been kind of chatting, chatting slowly back and forth a, a few times. I asked some people like online, like some of my friends on Facebook. I'm like, hey, how should I screw with this guy? And got some good ideas, but uh, at the end of the day, you what know, a dumbass. Kinda, 
Yeah, yeah, I had a little fun with it, but I couldn't I couldn't really do anything too evil. I couldn't bring myself to do it. Yeah, you still have a (laughs) reputation. Yeah, exactly. I can't can't have anything come back and reflect badly on the business. So as we're wrapping up, what do you think your biggest hurdle is right now to grow this business? Um, I think expanding into a better facility so that we can expand product line a little bit. You know, I want to be able to be a little bit more of a one-stop shop. I think once we get, get a facility that's going to allow us to, um, do beer and wine and possibly liquor that that's going to be a game changer for us. And then, you know, as we've been talking about, I think staffing is, is the big thing. I really, you know, I'm really approaching this with the things I've learned from the gig economy almost as cautionary tales. And I really am trying to take this back and build it like you would build just a regular small business and not try to, um, you know, it, it's, we're not DoorDash. We're not GoPuff. You know, yeah. I don't know how they do things, but you know, we're going to do things kind of in a smaller way. Yeah. You've kind of learned, you know, you can take some of the stuff from gig work like DoorDash and Grubhub, but you're like, OK, I'm going to do the opposite of this <laughs> because yeah, yeah. people are pissed about this or they're, you know, you're, and you've been I'm sure you've been a customer on the customer end of a Uber oh, Eats yeah. or a DoorDash. Yeah. And, and even me, like I ordered DoorDash about three weeks ago and that that was the last time uh, at Wingstop. And it was just I tipped really well, too. And, and it was like an hour before it got to me and it was cold as hell. And I'm like. I mean, what are we doing here? Like, I'm t- well. You could have a whole spinoff podcast of the other side of it too, where <laughs> yeah. you know drivers come on and complain about all the you know BS from the customers. Like, you know, sure. what happened to porch lights? I remember yeah. back in the eighties, people <laughs> put porch lights on when they ordered a damn pizza. Oh, porch <laughs> lights and addresses are the worst. Like, thank yeah. God for GPS. I mean, I oh. I'm old enough to remember. So I've been doing lawns for like twenty years. So I get laid off every winter, and I don't do unemployment. It's just not enough. So I remember delivering pizzas with maps, like not even without yeah. GPS, yeah. with like paper maps. So, I mean, you 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 depended on those those porch lights to get oh, you there. No. Oh yeah, and who designs the apartment complexes oh. with the numbers on those buildings? I mean, oh, come on. And, and, and forget about it out in Allendale. Those buildings oh. are stupid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You guys, at le- you guys need to have at least one episode a month that's just kind of a support group. You know, I, yes, I, I, like I can that. imagine a big Zoom group with like 18 boxes of just pissed off Uber drivers. <laughs> oh. We actually kind of have a support group, but it, it's, it's kind of a support network. We kind of, what do we have? Like 60 drivers in, in a group uh, in, in a big uh in a group group right now, we just kind of talk to talk to each other. I haven't been much in, included in that the last year or so because of COVID, but yeah, uh, it's been crazy. Yeah, it's a wild business. <laughs> All right, well, Absolutely. you got any more questions, Jesper? I do not. Do you have okay. anything, any comments for us, Toby? Do you have anything we haven't covered? Um, no, I appreciate you guys having me on. If anybody, you know, wants to, you know, again, like right now, what we're looking for is kind of the late night drivers that are already out there, you know, okay. s- sitting around. And, you know, it, if you don't want to wait in line, you know, 25 minutes at talk, or Taco Bell or McDonald's or whatever, and you want to just pull up, grab a bag and take off, you know. We, we might have some work for you. I got a guy in mind that would work perfect for that. So I'm yeah. gonna, I'm going to reach yeah, out. Yeah, so you can, they can email me at Toby, T-O-B-Y, at grtogo.com. It's just cool. G-R-T-O-G-O.com. Okay. And uh, the app is available in the uh, uh, Google Play Store and the iTunes store. Okay. So, uh, yeah, grab all that. All right. Well, thank you, Toby. Thanks. Uh, we really appreciate it. And have a great night. All right. Thank thanks, so Jason. Much, thanks, Jesper. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.